I'm here today with Susanna Snyder and Ellen Ott Marshall, authors of a new book titled Parenting for a Better World, Justice Practices for Your Family and the Planet, from Chalice Press. Susanna Snyder is lecturer in ethics and theology at Ripon College, Cuddleston, Oxford, England. She is also an associate member of the Faculty of Theology at the University of Oxford and an Anglican priest. She's published widely in the area of migration, refugees and theology, ethics and social justice. Ellen Ott Marshall is Associate Professor of Christian Ethics and Conflict Transformation at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. She focuses on contemporary Christian ethics with particular attention to violence, peace building, conflict transformation, gender, and moral agency. You can learn more about the book at chalicepress.com. So thanks so much to both of you for doing this work. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, well, we've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, so I'm really glad that uh, we were able to uh, schedule it. So maybe before we get into the book, though, each of you could, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about your background. Maybe, um, Susie, would you mind going first? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think you've said a, a few pieces of that in the intro there. So, um, uh, kind of following university the first time, I trained for ordination um, and worked in a parish uh, in the Church of England here in the UK. And then after that, I actually made my way to the States. And that's uh, where I met Ellen uh, when I was doing a postdoc at uh, Emory University in Candler School of Theology. Um, and I spent a few years in the States and probably significantly for the book. Uh, that's where I met my husband. Uh, um, uh. And then uh, after a few years in the States, meandering between Atlanta, uh, Boston, and then Austin, uh, found myself back in the UK. Um, and I've worked, as you said, uh, on kind of issues of migration and uh, uh, the support that churches have offered um, refugees and, and helping churches to reflect on that for a while, as well as some other um, kind of social justice issues. And now I'm teaching at a seminary here that trains um, women and men for ordained ministry in the Church of England. Awesome. And parenting, and parenting two small children. <laughs> Very, well, you're busy. <laughs> like that. You've got yeah. a lot going on there, I, <laughs> for sure, which is wonderful. Ellen, how about you? Yeah, so I, I teach at Candler School of Theology, um, where I teach Christian ethics and conflict transformation. And uh, most of my professional life has exactly been at that intersection of Christian ethics and questions of violence and peace building. And most concretely, in terms of work, that means trying to help religious leaders work with conflict more constructively in their uh, ecclesial spaces or their uh, civic work. And that's been profoundly meaningful and uh, an ever-present need, I think. Okay, so cool. um, the other dimension of my work and life that intersects with uh, a big commitment of Susie's has been refugee resettlement work. So before um, pursuing a PhD, I worked as a caseworker in refugee resettlement. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been a continuing thread for me such that now I um, work with students who do their contextual education sites in Clarkston, Georgia, which is a place that's a, a town of hyper diversity, thanks to about 30 years of refugee resettlement um, in Clarkston, and now just ongoing movements and migration. So uh, that common interest, I think, is one of the things that connected Susie and me in 2009, when she was at Candler in her postdoc, and I was here, uh, it was my first year on the faculty here. Mm. Um, so that was sort of our excuse to stay in touch for a while. And then we just became friends, so which has been <laughs> great. Uh, so when I'm not um, teaching, then I'm running around with older kids. Now we have our senior, we have a senior, uh, well, she just graduated from high school last week. And then we have twins that just finished eighth grade. Mm. So we're sort of moving into the college and high school phase of parenting and, you know, kind of wondering how that happened. <laughs> really? It goes fast, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, the title of the book is Parenting for a Better World, Justice Practices for Your Family and the Planet. How did the book come about? Yeah, well, I'll kick that one off. I, I think the short answer is just sort of life and friendship is how the book came about. I mean, I kind of, um, Susie and I, like so many parents, um, have wrestled with um, 
being fully present and attentive in our caregiving roles, and also responding to what we feel very clearly and strongly is a call to engage the world for work of social justice, ecological justice, environmental sustainability. So uh, trying to do that on top of our professional lives, we're always aware of how much is not getting done on all fronts. And that's something that we sort of beat ourselves up about, we mourn, uh, we, you know, feel bad about. Um, and it has been really helpful as friends to be in conversation about that. Um, and I think what we realized is that the conversations between us um, might be also helpful, well, first of all, to bring in more conversation partners and then to share those conversations with other parents. So that's really, honestly, the backstory on the book. And I think what happened for us is that because we both teach in theological schools, we were aware that we have sort of access to people who, in our perception, are doing this work of integration, parenting and social justice work really well. And we wanted to hear from them. And also that these people are sort of gifted at thinking theologically, reflecting spiritually on what they're doing, and then communicating that to other people. Mm. So that's kind of a unique set of gifts. And um, it was lovely for us to sit down and say, I mean, Susie reached out to me and said, would you help me pull together this book? And it was great for us to sort of think about who our dream team would be and then to reach out to people. And they said, yes. I mean, even <laughs> given everything that they're doing and in the context of COVID, they still said, yes, we'll write for that. Um, and it came about in 18 months, which for academic publishing, for any publishing is kind of amazing. Yes, absolutely. Quickly. So um, it was a um, an absolute gift for us to get to work with these people and read their writing. Um, and I think at this point, we just hope that it feels like a gift to the reader as well. So Susie, what's your perspective on uh, all of this, how it came about? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, very similar to Ellen's. Um, I think what we were keen about with the book as well was that it didn't just focus on the issues, that we weren't taking different justice questions in turn, important though they are, so that we didn't have a chapter on racism and we didn't have a chapter on sexism or ableism and classism and so on. What we really wanted to do was focus on different practices and we thought that that would be more helpful to parents and kind of bring a new angle in. So we've got chapters on prayer, we've got chapters on listening, on collage, on street protest, on giving out backpacks, on edible gardening, on community organs, on being kind, on waiting. So a huge range of different practices. Um, and we wanted really those to be in the foreground, um, in the front of people's minds. Um, and, and so that's really what brought our conversation um, or, or what has, if you like, been the, the threads that have brought our conversation together. Um, yeah, so each chapter, uh, we ask the author not just to talk about their own experience of the work, which they do, um, and we ask them to share what's gone wrong, what's been challenging, um, the mistakes that they've made, as well as the things that have gone well and the moments where you go, yes, this is all working and feeling good. Um, we ask them to talk about that, but also to theologically reflect on the practice. So why waiting? Where do we hear about that in scripture? How can we think about that theologically? How can we think about street protest theologically? Um, and we also really wanted, you know, not only to share stories and share theology, but also to give some really practical hints and tips as to how to go about it. So each of our chapters ends with a trying it out section. Mm. Some of those are kind of concrete step-by-step -step instructions as to how you might go about something. Others are much looser hints and tips. Um, and I think one of the joys of the book and one of the things that we hope that we've done in the way it's written in the the voice that we've written in it in is that it's designed to be invitational. Um, we want to invite our readers into a conversation. They will also have ideas um, and wisdom uh, to contribute to the conversation. And we're certainly not um, suggesting that we've got blueprints for action or have somehow worked out how to do it. Um, so those were really some of the things that as we talked and as we talked with the other contributors, we wanted this book to do a little bit differently. 
I just love the practical nature of that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you've got different contributors from Canada, the UK, and the US, which is wonderful. I love this, you know, cross continent, cross country collaboration. And in today's world of technology, it just, you know, makes that easier to do. But how did you decide, you know, how many contributors, who they would be, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take that one again. I guess it came up early in our conversation. Um, as you'll know, the publishing world is often uh, quite parochial. It focuses on its own national context or audience. And partly because our conversations across national boundaries have been really fruitful. Um, I've valued living in the US and learned so much uh, while I was there. I'm also married to an American. Um, we felt that there was something really fruitful um, in sharing across contexts. Um, so there are, of course, very uh, distinct differences between our contexts, um, not least our, our accents. Um, but there are also some real similarities. So, you know, we are nations, all three nations, US, UK and, and Canada, that have colonial pasts um, and are dealing with imperialistic tendencies of different types um, in the present. Um, we all have kind of neoliberal um, capitalist consumerist economies. And we're all seeing huge increases in political division and far right politics. What's more, our churches are facing the same kinds of questions, financial and kind of numeric decline in our congregations. Again, increasing splits between evangelicals and conservatives and progressives or liberals. Um, and a kind of a, a sense, therefore, that actually sharing uh, something from our own context across national boundaries and in a cross-cultural way might be really fruitful and shed some new angles or lenses um, on what it means to parent in relation to social justice. Um, one of the interesting uh, discussions we had at the editorial stage of the book was how to deal with language. Um, you know, do you talk about diapers or nappies uh, when you're talking nappies. about babies? Um, yeah, so, so these were you know, we really dealt with the cross-cultural in its kind of minutiae as well as <laughs> in the bigger conversational uh, issues. Ellen, uh, anything to add on that? No, I, I mean, Susie laid it out so perfectly. She was taking me back to, oh, I remember these conversations where we were thinking about why have a, a transnational approach. That was so perfect. I think the only thing that I would add is um, this sense of how... Um, kind of comforting or sort of reassuring it is to think about um, if we're all doing our own sort of little part, doing the little bit that we can, to know that there are parents not only around Atlanta, but also in the UK, also in Canada, just kind of reminding us um, that if we think sort of collectively about the work of parenting, um, that it's a it's a kind of reassuring collaborative reminder, right, that we're all in this together. And, all kinds of different ways, but but there's sort of shared struggles across them, and that's reassuring and helpful. So in the book's description, it says that it offers practical strategies to help committed and overcommitted people integrate caregiving and justice work into their daily lives. My perception in talking with you know lots of different folks is that people are like committed up to here. Yeah. You know, overcommitted is definitely the, the term. So how are you helping? parents, caregivers deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, should I start on this one, Susie? And oh. then we'll go back. Um, so I think one way is, um, uh, and this is probably our also main takeaway from the book, or one of the things that we would hope most to communicate is that you don't have to do everything, <laughs> but it really is that small things matter. And I think one of the words that we want to communicate is that if we can do these small things with intention and see these different kinds of commitments and work as integrated, that that makes it both uh, sort of feel more doable and lessen some of the um, sort of intensity around it, right? The sense that we have to be functioning at this really high uh, sort of overcommitted level all the time, or we're failing on all fronts. But a huge middle ground there that's full of these small steps done with intention that help us to integrate 
the work of parenting, the work of social justice, environmental sustainability, and our own sense of vocation. So I think that kind of communicating that word is one part of helping committed and overcommitted parents. And I think the other is inviting them to think really concretely about particular practices. And we use that uh, term practice really intentionally. I mean, it, a practice is something that you do repeatedly and needs to be sort of sustainable over time. And the, the belief is that this repeated activity is shaping our character. It's helping to form our families. It's shaping communities. And those practices, if they're going to be repeatable and sustainable, also need to be small and doable. Um, and so I, I think the other thing is that they also need to be um, sort of nourishing in some way, that we can't sort of name practices that exhaust us repeatedly, but we need to think about practices that are also nourishing. So one of the things that I think happens as a thread in this book is that there are a lot of us who are talking about a kind of social justice practice that is also connected with a spiritual discipline. And that kind of sense of these two things our sort of outward activity and our attention to our interior lives, that needs to be really wedded together mm -hmm. so that the work that we do is also nourishing of our spirits, as well as our family and the world. And so there are several sort of um, practices where the try it out or several chapters where the try it out section is about prayer or meditation or thinking about singing lullabies to your child as a kind of subversive act, right? So the way in which these also meditative activities are also social justice activities and they still nourish the spirit. They don't just exhaust us in kind of the external activism of life. But Susie, would you like to add something to? Yeah, I mean, I think just to echo that sense that we really felt that um, you know, we're formed through the everyday. And actually, so, you know, the everyday really matters. And we tend to overlook it often for the grand gestures or the big moments um, or stuff that takes a lot of time and gets a lot of press. But what we actually realized, and I think it, 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 it was a really life-giving, certainly for me, um, an encouraging and exciting discovery, I think, that, that came more and more to the surface as we wrote our own chapters and read others, was that actually it's in the everyday actions that we take as parents, as colleagues, as um, just people in the world, that we actually have the most effect on the world. So through what we buy, what we choose to spend our time doing, um, who we spend our time with and how. And that actually those are really small scale kind of things, almost in the noise, but actually they're where the big stuff really happens. Mm. Um, so, you know, to give, Ellen's given a few examples, but just thinking, you know, one of our contributors is talking about listening to his kid and actually about how listening well is so important. And because if you're listening well to your kid, you have a good relationship with your kid. Your kid is going to grow up to be engaged with others. And actually listening well in community is super important to do, to engage in social justice work that's mutual and not patronizing and doing too. Um, in my own chapter, I talk about edible gardening and I have just some wonderful memories, also some not very wonderful memories, but some wonderful memories of, of gardening with my kids. Um, you know, and I won't say they're always eager to pull out weeds and, and get their fingers <laughs> dirty, but there are some really beautiful moments where we've had great time as a family when we're planting seeds or pulling up a carrot that's all wonky. And we just have a lot of love and laughter over that. Um, and yet it's also saying something important about how we practice our relationship to food in a way that is sustainable and mindful. So I think those are a few examples, uh, perhaps that kind of ground what we're trying to say here. Yeah. I think it's really great that, you know, you talk about the small things, you know, and the things that seem small to us adults, you know, oftentimes a big deal for children because they're just learning. And, you know, the interaction that they have with a parent or other adult, you know, is incredibly life forming. 
um, whether we know that that's what's going on or not. So it's it's really nice to see you all paying attention to that aspect of you know a, a child parent relationship and, and their development. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> so Brian, can I say something? In sure, sure, go ahead. That? I appreciate that observation. I I think um, one of the things that developed in the book that's really lovely is that our kids also shaped the practices that we write about. And uh, the one that I think is most fully on display is a conversation between Carlton Mackey and his son, Isaiah. And Isaiah um, and Carlton are, are talking about this experience of um, having people uh, coming across people who are then asking for money or for help on the street or at a corner, that kind of thing. And what Isaiah does is that he um, takes 10% of money he earns. And in the chapter, they explain sort of how he's earned his money, but 10%. And he uses that to buy um, uh, gallon bags, bottles of water, clean socks, a granola bar, um, and some fruit snacks. And he puts those items in this gallon Ziploc bag and they keep it in the back of their car. Wow. And as they're driving around the city, if they come to a stoplight and someone comes to Carlton to the dad's window, Carlton points to the back. The person goes to the back. Isaiah rolls down his window and hands his what they call give back packs out. Uh, and so that's Isaiah's practice. And wow. so this conversation is the two of them talking about how that came together. And the try it out section is actually a transcript of a recording, an interview I did with them where um, Isaiah describes the steps that he follows to create this give back pack. So well, that it's is so really cool. The the yeah, it's great. Wow. <laughs> that, that, wow. What a role model, you know, yeah, kind exactly. of situation. But also uh, just to hear the description of how it evolved, you know, it's got to be great. <laughs> yeah. <that's> great. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times, you know, when people will read a book, you know, they'll go into the attic or the basement, you know, quickly and be forgotten. This doesn't seem like the kind of book that people will do that with. I mean, if it really is inspiring practices i mean does it go in the kitchen or the nightstand and the office or, or, how is the book used um, you know <laughs> in relationship to other books yeah oh that's such a great question i love that yeah i hope it doesn't go into the attic or the basement <laughs> um unless the kids are playing there maybe <laughs> Um, yeah well i think we hope that it uh stays in wherever the um uh, the most active room of the house is, um, I, I think um, the way it's, we hope it's used is uh, slowly and in, in pieces, I think. I, I think it would be a shame, given sort of our intention to slow things down, think with intention, think about the small things. It would be a shame for someone to sort of feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to cram this book. I've got to read this book quickly and then do everything it says. Right? That's not at all what we mean. It really is well, Susie used language of invitation earlier, and that's just perfect. I mean, it is an invitation to listen to these different contributors and what's been helpful to them and to their families, and to think about what might be helpful to you and your family. Um, that the practices in the book, we think they're great, and there's a nice mix that hopefully um, some would work for people, but they're also invitations to think about what would work well for you and your family. So they aren't kind of one size fits all uh, practices. So I think I would hope that individuals would uh, slowly read the book over time, um, try out the different uh, practices that are there. Uh, there is beautiful diversity in this book in terms of authorship, uh, family structures, um, the practices themselves, the scripture or the other form of theological reflection that people do. And so that diversity means that people will both find themselves in the book and find experiences that are not theirs. Um, and that diversity is kind of woven throughout. So you don't have to sort of intentionally say, I'm going to read chapter two and then six and seven. So I get some diversity. It's kind of throughout. Mm -hmm. So people can just read along for that and then try out the practices that they find and adapt. The other thing that we're really hoping is that, um, and we've written with this in mind, is that this would be good for groups. So for church groups who need a kind of um, four to six week book study, this is kind of written with that in mind. Oh, good. 
Um, so we have uh, a website, which is parentingbetterworldbook.com. And on that website, there's a resources tab where we'll be putting discussion guides uh, that groups could access. Uh, and so we hope that those will be helpful. But also, again, we would encourage groups to tackle, you know, three or four chapters at a time, move sort of slowly, think about um, the practices, try them out. And then what I would love for groups to do is to have a final session where they don't read anything from our book, but they just bring their own reflections to each other and maybe try out some writing if they enjoy doing that. Um, but to think for themselves where the struggles are, what the practices are that they've done that might be helpful to sort of follow the pattern of reflection in the book and see what they can sort of generate out of their own, the wisdom of their own groups. Wow. Any thoughts, Susie? Yeah, I, need, I mean, again, I need to echo what Ellen said so well. Um, I think there are all sorts of ways that people can use the book. And I think we'd relish hearing about people using the book in different ways and drawing on it. Uh, some people may want to, to read it and reflect on it. Others may be the kind of people who pick up a chapter and they're like, wow, that's an exciting idea. I want to try it out. Um, and as Alan, Ellen said, there's so much diversity in the book. There are practices that will work better with teenage children and practices that work better if you have toddlers or babies. Um, you, we've got a couple of fantastic uh, chapters from Leah Gunning Francis and Melissa Pagan exploring uh, their own, um, you know, their own practices with their teenage kids. Um, and those are really beautiful and, and, and resourceful. Those, those may not be the, the chapters that people who've got a baby in arms would necessarily go to first. Um, so again, just an invitation to explore the book and use it individually or corporately in ways that work uh, for the reader. So um, I'd like to read a portion of one of the endorsements for the book. This is from Dr. Luther Smith at Candler, who I was actually on a different Zoom with last night. Um, <laughs> he says, this book addresses difficult questions that parents often face. So what are some of the difficult questions that the book deals with? I can start on that one if you want. Um, I think some of the difficult questions certainly that I faced are how can I do it all? Uh, should I be doing it all? What does all look like? Which issues do we start to address? How do I balance the needs of my children and the desire to be a, a good and supportive um, parent? with the desire and recognition that we're called to have a horizon and an engagement with the world that's beyond uh, the people who live in our own household. Um, how do we do this all with integrity? And how do we not go mad and lose any sense of self-care or attention to our own need for rest in the process? Um, so those are the kind of parenting questions. So there are other questions that come into this like, um, for, for a number of our contributors, how do I help my child to engage in addressing the oppression they're facing, yeah. whether because of their own racial ethnic backgrounds or because of their ability disability status uh, or because of their gender? How do I help them to engage that in positive ways, um, in ways that enable them to feel like they're contributing to the world while also developing and nurturing their own identity. Um, and I think those are some of the really important deeper questions even that, that um, add texture and complexity to what we're, we're discussing in the book. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great, Susie. I was sitting here thinking, I, I think another set of questions and real struggles for the parents is kind of how to encourage our children to do this work um, of social justice, um, sort of aware of uh, the, without making false promises about it. Uh, so encouraging um, this kind of engagement with the world that is so obviously fraught and painful and violent, um, and to be honest about that. And I think that also, Susie was talking about sort of the different stages of our families, the different ages of our kids. And I think you'll see that in the book is that there's a different level of sort of transparency and honesty with our kids at their different ages. 
Um, but one of the, again, a really powerful chapter is Keith Hebden's chapter on um, community organizing, which uh, he in includes reflections with his teenage daughter on this and her experiences of community organizing with him. But the starting place for that book is a kind of reckoning with the sense that for them, participating in protests alone didn't feel sufficient, that they needed to do something in addition to protesting. They also wanted to engage in the sort of ongoing, slow going labor of community organizing. And to sort of hear the teenager reflecting on this sense of sort of what actually makes change possible is really quite profound. And I think you feel that as you engage in, yeah, Melissa Pagan's chapter and Leah Gunning Francis chapter, um, several of them. And, and I mean, them, all of them <laughs> are sort of wrestling with, gosh, how do we help our children practice a kind of hope without being, um, you know, Pollyanna-ish or optimistic about, too overly optimistic, dangerously optimistic about uh, the prospect for change in the world, mm -hmm. right? How do we build in them a kind of resiliency that can endure? This just really sounds like a very helpful book. I've got to believe that there's a lot of folks that, you know, are, are looking for something like this and really will be able to take advantage of it. Um, and, you know, today as we speak is, is the launch of the book, right? So, I mean, it's, it's officially available, you know, as we're doing this recording today. So that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, so what would be like the one thing that each of you would like for readers to take away from the book? Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to say, again, to sort of be encouraged by the small things. And um, I think the, the work of um, parenting and social ecological justice on top of our professional lives, out, all the stuff we're doing outside of the home, the multiple fronts, all of that can just be daunting and kind of paralyzing. And I think to sort of break it down into tasks um, and to celebrate the small things that we do and to do them with intention, I think that's a, a main takeaway to, and sort of be encouraged that your small thing is part of a collage of small things from other people. Uh, and that, that to, it's, it has to be a collaborative effort on all fronts. Um, and the more that we can take heart by what other people are doing um, and feel encouraged, I think the better, the more we'll be sort of sustained in this ongoing labor. Susie? Wonderfully put, Ellen. Um, what would I say? I'll, be, I'll try to be really pithy and quick here. I'd say look for what brings you life and what you find fun and energizing. Um, and hold two things in tension. Be courageous and be gentle on yourself. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So again, the name of the book is Parenting for a Better World, Justice Practices for Your Family and the Planet. And you can learn more. Is it parentingbetterworld.com? It's parentingbetterworldbook.com. Parentingbetterworldbook.com. Wonderful. Well, congratulations to you guys. And um, I hope we see some more things, you know, out of you down, um, down the road. And um, I think we have some other collaboration opportunities we'll be working on as well. So um, thank you so much for, for this work and for spending time to share it with us today. Great. Thank you so very much. much.